Okay, so um, put my watch out here, Pete. Uh, you're the one that started this thing as far as timing. Um, we're only about 15 minutes behind. I, I barely clear my throat in 15 minutes. Um, okay, so I'm looking at it, and I'm going to be sensitive to it. Uh, but uh, he did actually uh, put five speakers on here. Uh, actually, I suggested to him four of them. I didn't suggest myself. Um, he put me on, so I think he wants me to talk about cryptococcal treatment guidelines, experience, evidence, and controversies. Uh, you can see my conflicts. I'll come back to that. My conflicts of conflicted me to be able to do guidelines anymore, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and so over the next 20 minutes, 25 minutes, I'd, I'd like to go through looking at the guidelines, and if there's one thing I can say about them, it's all about writing. It's all about what you say and how you say it. And I think you'll see, you'll see that as we go along can't do a talk without cryptococcus actually looking at it with an Indian ink. So there sits the organism that I saw mm, some 40 years ago uh, when I did an LP on a patient in, uh, on Valentine's Day in 1978 and looked under and that was H99 there. So that's the picture of him or her. Um, and uh, so from that, what, um, what about the guidelines? How do we treat them? So here's an example of the 2010 up-to-date, uh, uh, the up-to-date guidelines for 2010, done by 16 people you have up there, and there's all my acknowledgments of what's going to happen in the next few minutes about the data and, and description of it. Uh, it was done after one that was done in 2002, so in about eight years, and uh, it, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the insights of the written word uh, in the next uh, few minutes. What I knew that is important about guidelines is what you say and how you say it uh, was this example, the abstract of the guidelines. And I think you see it up there. Um, it was a pretty generic guidelines that we wrote. I thought it was pretty generic. I made a mistake, I guess, because in fact the last sentence was a disaster for all the lawyers that read the guidelines. Um, they came into my office one day to talk about the uh, their patient, uh, not that I actually, um, I was trying to teach them, actually, the lawyers, not to uh, actually be part of the uh, system. Uh, when they came in, they said, well, Dr. Perfect, the first thing, the problem is your guidelines. We have no chance in this case because it said down there, if the diagnosis is made early, if clinicians adhere to the basic principles of these guidelines, and if the underlying disease is controlled, then cryptococcosis can be managed successfully in the vast majority of cases. Boy, I thought that was pretty, pretty generic. But actually, it turns out that they had not exactly followed the guidelines in this patient, but it was a clinical decision, bad outcome, and the lawyers on the other side are going to say, hmm, the guidelines say you should have had a good response. You have, most of these patients should have been okay, and our patient did not do well. It was the first time, again, to emphasize to me how important words are and how important you describe these things. And the guidelines are used not only by us as clinicians, but are used by the legal profession significantly. Now, if I'm doing guidelines, I, think I, I thought on these things after we did the guidelines is, hmm, I wonder how good they are. Um, we went back and looked at our own place uh, at what happened to Duke and if we followed the guidelines. And if we followed the guidelines, actually, it turned out that um, we did have a higher rate of, uh, if we didn't follow the guidelines, we had a higher rate of persistent infection. So it seemed like the guidelines are pretty good there. Now, receiving the IDSA guidelines uh, and the recommended doses and stuff had an increased incidence of uh, attributable mortality. So, you know, sounds like if we follow the guidelines, maybe we'll do better. Now, remember, these are patients long before the guidelines came out. Uh, and then the other thing that I learned over time when you really look at it is, is this drug called flucytosine. It turned out that if patients had received at, less, uh, at least seven days of flucytosine at our hospital, that uh, in fact uh, they did better than the ones that got jerked around all over the place and never got uh, consistent uh, flucytosine. Uh, and then I also noticed that, um, that uh, the patients there were a third of the patients that never received their induction therapy on that 14 days consistently. 
and it influenced a little bit, I think, the guidelines and where we've gone with this thing is one of the most important things in the treatment of cryptococcal meningitis is the consistency of behavior of induction therapy. And when you try to play around with it, it's not a good idea. And finally, uh, I, I keep having people say, oh, why are we even dealing with cryptococcus? We've got that under control. All these patients do well. And uh, we don't need new drugs for it. Well, I guess maybe in Durham, North Carolina, we're a place where we kind of still need new drugs. Uh, you can see up there the mortality rate of HIV-infected patients and transplant patients was 16% when we reviewed it. And if you're not one of those groups, you're in the non-AIDS, non-transplant group, you had a 30% mortality. Um, I'm just not convinced that we know how to treat these patients day in and day out. Now, what did I get back on the guidelines as far as feedback over the last seven, eight, nine years since they've been out there? There were four, there were four things that came back to me, four questions. The first one was, why do non-HIV and non-transplant patients have longer induction periods for cryptococcal meningitis than, uh, groups, uh, uh, than other uh, groups, too? Uh, versus uh, four weeks, and so in other groups, meaning the HIV patients and transplant patients. The uh, second one was why are corticosteroids not considered for increased intracranial pressure? Why are there not recommended uh, recommendations for non-HIV and non-transplant patients in resource-limited uh, environments? And why isn't lipid amphotericin B primary therapy in the recommendation for induction therapy instead of amphotericin B disoxycholate, which should be an alternative? Those were the four questions. The first one's a tricky one, uh, and in fact, uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, why are corticosteroids not used for increased intracranial pressure? Um, I think some of the ways it's probably not proven to actually be used and successful unless you have virus. Why are transplant, non-AIDS, non-transplant patients in resource-limited areas not in the guidelines? <laughs> I didn't see any data. Uh, and it's actually an important issue we'll come back to in a moment. Most of the data comes from limited resource areas for cryptococcal disease today. But that's not, a, it's almost all in HIV infected patients. And finally, why is lipid amphotericin B not the primary therapy for cryptococcal meningitis and induction therapy in resource available places? Well, that's been a troublesome situation for us in the guidelines for a time. Uh, and in fact, we've never quite come to grips with it because I don't believe there's any randomized controlled trial of lipid amphotericin Bs and flucytosine together. But over time, as I mentioned, one of the important things is to get drugs in these patients very effectively. And amphotericin B dextoxicolate does not do a good job of that. And so you will see in a moment the guidelines, the wording of the guidelines, the wordings of the things to try to bolster up the issue of what's really happening in clinical practice and probably the right thing to do. These are the organizations of the guidelines. We had it in three groups. Uh, we then went on to look in at ma man uh, managements of uh, complications. We looked at non-managial disease. Uh, we looked at spatial situations like pregnancy, uh, children, resource-limited environments, and cryptococcus gadii. Now, I'm just going to take the next couple minutes going over the guidelines and what they actually said and point out a few points. What is the treatment of cryptococcal meningoencephalitis in HIV-infected individuals, induction therapy? There it is up there today, amphotericin B, 0.7 milligrams per kilogram to 1.0 uh, milligrams per kilogram plus flucytosine for two weeks uh, for HIV-infected patients. Um, and with renal concerns, substitute uh, ambisone or ABLC. And then you see the alternative regimens down there, which included uh, liposomal amphotericin B. Um, okay, that's the data. This is 2010. This is what we had. They had the various alternative regimens, as you can see up here, uh, including adding fluconazole uh, in combination, uh, fluconazole and flucytosine together. And you look up there at the doses, uh, uh, 400 to 800 milligrams of fluconazole in combination. Today, the ACTA study would suggest uh, that should be 1,200 milligrams. Uh, you looked at uh, fluconazole as far as by itself. We didn't really want to use fluconazole by itself, but uh, suggested 1,200 milligrams would be favored as a dose. You saw up there from David's work that actually 1,200 milligrams is probably not enough. 
What is the treatment of cryptococcal meningitis in HIV-infected patients uh, going far, farther and in the sequence of events, like we started with the uh, Vanderhorst study in 1997? Um, the start of heart therapy, I want to emphasize that thing. We suggested at that time two to ten weeks, and lo and behold, this thing has played around uh, over time. The COAT pro uh, uh, project actually suggested not getting it earlier, but exactly where that sweet spot is at, in the resource limited environment and the resource available environment is still not clear. We suggested at a time that asymptomatic uh, uh, antigenemia, now this is eight years ago or so, that you should use fluconazole at two to 400 milligrams uh, uh, until immune reconstitution. Today, uh, the WHO has suggested 800 milligrams. So I'm not sure exactly where they've got that, but they've kind of uh, uh, brokered it with what the uh, studies are trying to be done. Primary prophylaxis was not recommended, and we'll come back to that. What is the appropriate management of CNS and non-CNS uh, cryptococcosis in transplant patients? The important point here is back then, we knew the kidneys were important. We knew the toxicity of amphotericin B, and there's just no way one with a transplant should actually get amphotericin B disoxycholate. And so primary therapy with amazon or ABLC was recommended. What are the specific issues in management of cryptococcus in uh, solid organ recipients? I think the biggest thing is number three down there. I put it in yellow. Immune suppressive management, we suggested sequential or stepwise reduction in consideration of lowering corticosteroid dose first because a member of the calcineurin inhibitors do have antifungal activity, have anticryptococcal activity. I think that's a tricky business because we've never really got it specific uh, for the uh, patient population and for the physicians, but I think it's kind of important that they do reduce some of those, particularly the mycophenolate, et cetera, et cetera, because I do see an awful lot of iris uh, popping up in this population. Uh, what is the treatment for CNS, the disease of non-AIDS, uh, non-transplant? This has uh, really been a problem for the guidelines uh, going forward in the defense of it. When it was done, it was suggested for them to get induction therapy for four weeks. And yet AIDS patients and transplant patients was two weeks because they had data. We looked back at the old data coming from the 80s and stuff like that, and there was a lot of concern from those 16 people, at least some of those 16 people, that the non-AIDS, non-transplant could fail significantly, and we needed longer exposure until we had data in the non-AIDS, non-transplant population. Well, that's 10 years, almost a decade ago. We still don't have data in that population of patients. And so you see down there, there's all kinds of manipulations in how the patient population could actually have induction therapy for two weeks. Uh, again, without any uh, data, but the concern about the length of time of giving this, these drugs combination for four weeks without really good data today that that was actually successful. What do you do to manage a patient that has persistent infection or relapses with meningitis or another site? I think here one of the things with the guidelines, I would say, is that they at least tried and attempted to try to say, this is maybe at a time when you got a persistent infection. We suggested four weeks. Uh, I'm not sure necessarily that's right, but again, it's a persistence of infection, and not a persistence of an, of an antigen positivity, not a persistence of, uh, of an Indian ink that's positive. It's a culture that's continuously being positive. I think that at least sets it in the sand of trying to uh, develop uh, programs around what persistence means, or... Uh, uh, or, or even in relapse, uh, what do you do about relapse? And if they do come back and have, have a relapse, how do you treat it? And again, we don't really have good data on that, but we would suggest that the, there isn't a lot of resistance here in combination therapy, and that one just needs to go back and restart the same drugs again and reduce and reinduce again. I think so far there's not been any data on that, but no one's come up and yelled and screamed and said that's a bad thing to do. What is the management of immune constitution, uh, immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome? Of all the cases I get, of all the discussions I get, the, the vast majority of problems on my internet, uh, I, don't, I don't publicize this, they just emails show up in my box every so often, a couple times a week, uh, about how to manage cryptococcal meningitis that's not going poorly or is not seeming to uh, respond. And I think the vast, vast majority of these are actually related to immune reconstitution syndrome, IRIS. Uh, I think you've got to recognize it. 
I think we still need to be more precise in our immune suppression for that, whether that's steroids, whether that's prednisone, what the dose of that is, the duration of that, whether you use dexamethasone or not. Uh, these things are just not precise enough yet. And so you end up having to do it. You have to suck it up and actually use these things in these type of patients, and remarkably, they can do quite well. But the problem is the guidelines are not precise enough to know when to, when to actually, what kind of dose, and uh, when, to, uh, when to stop. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of times, and particularly in resource available areas, as I'll show you in a moment, we have almost no studies almost no studies in cryptococcal disease in the last decade. Um, pressure is another whole issue. We put some guesses out there. My gosh, we guessed on this thing. We still don't know uh, with this, these guidelines, and yet the lawyers look at this as a precise uh, measurement of everything. Uh, I think it's important that we pay attention to pressure. I think people die of that. But the guidelines just don't have the robustness of understanding the pathophysiology and the preciseness. I'm going to go. With cryptococcomas, we made a guess. And we went ahead and actually used uh, six weeks in a patient with cryptococcomas. Oh, I don't really have any data on that thing for induction therapy, the length of time. And then anybody come back and uh, yell and scream at us on that. Uh, it has always been concerned that in the parenchyma, maybe it may be harder to clear that up. But in all of cryptococcal meningitis is meningoencephalitis. There's usually some involvement of the parenchyma in all these cases. Uh, I'm going for time. I'm going by the uh, pulmonary stuff. Uh, uh, which is kind of clearly in the, in, in the area, looking at immune-compromised hosts, uh, actually uh, treating them with pulmonary disease that may be limited. Uh, in immune-suppressed patients, you do need to check the central nervous system, make sure there's not organisms in it. I had a case the other day with a, a transplant patient, and they talked to me about that had crypto from an ear, and he was on the plane getting ready to go to London. And they says, oh, well, he's a transplant patient. He's got crypto coming out of his ear and stuff like that. What should we do? I said, well, I think you've got to get him back and actually do an LP on him and see if he's got it in the central nervous system. Now, he says the patient wanted to go to London, so they went off to London. Uh, the guy had an allergic reaction or something that put on steroids for a week or two uh, and finally came back to us. And uh, he says, well, okay, I'm going to hope that he... He started getting a headache over there, too. Yeah, well, the headache was going, too. Anyway, um, I think those type of patients, immune-suppressed patients, need lumbar punctures to make sure you don't have central nervous system disease. The non-A's are the non-immune-suppressed patients. I actually think you can get away, and we've done this over time. We put it in the recommendations. If they don't have symptoms, they're asymptomatic and no underlying disease, they probably don't need a lumbar puncture when they have pulmonary disease. I'm going by a couple of these... Now, I want to make a couple points at the end of this thing, and it's my opportunity to do this with guidelines and everything. I think that one of the things we do in infectious disease is we kind of binary. It's either positive or negative. But we do have some places where you actually have quantitation of the microbe burden. We see that in bacterial counts in the urine. We surely do that in our viral loads all the time for both HIV and Hep C. I always find it kind of amusing to me and still kind of confusing to me uh, why we don't end up doing it in cryptococcal disease and actually look at it, and as was talked about, the EFA, the effective fungicidal activity and the fungal burden. Uh, why don't we do that? Well, I mean, if I look up here, and I, there's a lot of data, a lot of data and how important the, the quantitative counts in the CSF are from both prognostic and, uh, and potentially therapeutic uh, endeavors. All have done maybe in Africa and places like that. And heaven forbid, if you're in the United States of America and you have to do a test that isn't done through some type of machine, uh, that you actually have to put it out on a plate and quantitate it and dilute it and stuff like that. I think uh, we just can't seem to get to that point. And yet, you know what the guidelines say about cryptococcal meningitis? In follow-up, do an LP at two weeks. Well, okay. And we say, well, it's two weeks about. I mean, we've got to make decisions here. Uh, a patient's going to go home, et cetera, et cetera. And you're right. It, two weeks doesn't make a lot of sense. But what if we were doing quantitative counts, and we actually did quantitative counts? Somebody's got a zero on the back. Now, I'll, I'm ruling this right now. I got to give me my five more minutes. Um, okay, so um, what... Uh, why don't we do quantitative counts? Why don't we actually look at the burden of organisms, the viable organism? And heaven forbid, why don't we do this and actually tap the patient at three to five days and see how the therapy is actually doing? We have pretty good guidelines to know what the colony form unit should be. 
And that might help us a lot with iris. That might help us a lot with uh, the adjustments of these, uh, of these therapies and the length of the therapies. I put that up as a, a challenge to people because I'm sitting in my computer with a white paper on this thing. And I keep on getting rejected from my own people sitting around here even before I get it out for a review. So uh, my chance. Okay. Uh, finally, um, I'm not going to go through all these questions and stuff like that uh, because of time and somebody just gave me a zero up there, except I'm not really zero yet. Uh, well, maybe I'll say one thing. On the Should we elevate lipid formulation amphoteris B over amphoteris B in resource available places? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to show you what we did with that, or at least what I've done with that. Um, um, okay. Questions. Well, I have a question. Does the IDSA guidelines need a revision in the next one to two years? Uh, or are they good for another five years? Well, I put this out there in the crypto uh, meeting 2014. Uh, 2014. Uh, and um, they said yes. Well, there was a tremendous amount of people who raised their hands and said yes, we need to do that. So in 2017, I did the same question. And they said, oh, yes, yes, yes. So I kind of took it on myself saying, well, you know, there's some things going on here. Maybe we should tweak it a little bit. And so I pushed the idea, say, multiple times. And um, I finally got back my answer, which is, okay, Dr. Perfect, maybe you're right. Maybe we should have the guidelines. But you're not going to be the person doing it. You're not going to be the chair of those things. Because we have guidelines that prohibit... Uh, people to be chairs and members, et cetera, et cetera. And some stuff up there you can actually see. Some of it makes sense. It's directly uh, related to the uh, pharmaceutical companies or the products and stuff like that. Not a big problem. But it goes on to say the IDSA guidelines can have a conflict of interest in the members and chairs. Uh, some relationships are allowed, and you can see some of them up there. And some of them seem reasonable. If you want to be an advisor and stuff like that, and it's research activity and not promotion, that seems to be okay. I think the one that got me finally was the presentations at national or international meetings that are non-promotional, -prom uh, no direct payment to the individual, and must be through a third party, through various types of things. And that's okay for everybody but the chair. The chair can't do that. So the um, best I know at this stage with the guidelines is I'm not sure where they're at. <laughs> I mean, there's somebody out in the audience that they let go on and uh, start this thing, but they said you could not do it. Now, I want to finish with the issues, if we want to do new guidelines, uh, what are the other guidelines doing? The WHO guidelines. Uh, and you can see up here, that they are in March of 2018, I emphasized a couple points. They had art therapy starting at four to six weeks because remember WHO is doing something and there's a big divide here. A big divide between the resource available and the resource limited societies. And they have issues around patients dying of their underlying disease long before they can wait for that 10 week uh, period. They also had the preemptive CRAG therapy and they suggested 800 milligrams instead of the 400, uh, two to 400 that we had suggested. Uh, and if there's no CRAG available, fluconazole prophylaxis uh, should be started with less than 100. Again, this is places with high risk of disease, high uh, uh, cryptococcal disease. We suggested none. Uh, and induction therapy with amphoteris would be 0.7 milligrams per kilogram and flucytosine for one week, followed by 1,200 milligrams of fluconazole a day. And I'll tell you, I like the ACTA study. I think it was a great study. But in resource available areas, I cannot tell you how many people come up and say, oh, we only need to create cryptococcal meningitis for a week with amphoteris and flu cytosine induction. I don't think that's the message that should come out of these things. NIH CDC criteria, a couple things up there. They recommended quotes by some experts to actually do preemptive testing. Uh, and then uh, potentially treat. No prophylaxis. Amphoteris would be, what did they say? Formulation. It's all about the words. Uh, they didn't go and finally say uh, lipid product of amphoteris B or amnesone. They said an amphoteris B formulation with flucytosine is recommended. And they went back to the prudent uh, delay of art for two to ten weeks. That's relevant because in this day and age, what happens? as it's all about the words. You've got to get to this, these guidelines quickly, and you have to get them out to the people. And I've found over time that as much as our guidelines do things, they're extraordinarily important to lawyers, they're extraordinarily important to uh, uh, physicians, to insurance companies, and actually to the physicians. But the thing that really impacts our physicians in resource available areas is up to date. And I've had the opportunity for the last few years to write the cryptococcal 
chapters on up to date. Over 100,000 hits a year on those chapters, on that particular, uh, those several chapters. And I put up there a question because I spent hours trying to think exactly how to write out the guidelines that I had to deal with with f B and flu cytosine uh, induction therapy. And what I did is say for non-pregnant adults, we suggest that induction therapy consists of a lipid formulation of f B plus flu cytosine as primary therapy. Well... Do I have any data on that? Not really, but that's the way we do them. And we had the idea that the most important thing is that you get those two weeks in without interruption and get that flu cytosine in properly. Now, the other thing I've noticed is sometimes these guidelines are all over the place and you can't find them. But one of the great things of being an editor up to date is somebody is out there looking for them all the time and they ship you out and say, what do you think about this? And I go, whoa, I don't know. Uh, this is from the International Antiretroviral, Antiretroviral Society USA panel. And buried way into that paneling discussion of all the antiretrovirals in the world was this statement. For patients with cryptococcal meningitis in high resource settings with access to optimal antifungal therapy, frequent monitoring, and aggressive management of intracranial pressure, ART should begin within two weeks of diagnosis. So they said, my editor says, is that what we should do? We should put that in there? Well, they actually quoted the IDSA guidelines. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. And um, the article that they also had was an abstract from 2015 that's never been published. So again, it's tricky business in how you word these things and where these guidelines uh, end up. And uh, I think it is important that we uh, pay attention to the wording. So in summary, one of the biggest things about guidelines today is that it is a lot of times being dri driven by resource-limited studies in cryptococcal disease, and we'll talk about that more later. There are five pivotal studies that have been done recently. The fungicidal response of amphotericin flu cytosine and the success in mortality, the Jeremy Day study, the steroid impact in early use in cryptococcal meningitis, another Day study. Art timing uh, with David Bullower and group that we had some ways that there was some concern about giving that early in the administration. The ACTA study that I've talked about that showed the doses of flu cytosine and flu conals all that were proper and unfortunately for us tricks us a little bit uh, because I think uh, this one week therapy is not necessarily relevant to uh, uh, resource available places. And finally, immune modulation at the interferon studies that were done by Joe Jarvis. These are the kind of main studies that were done uh, in resource-limited environments. If I could sing like Peter, Paul, and Mary, I'd say, where have all the crypto studies gone in the USA? Uh, somewhere, I don't know, but uh, they've gone. These are the three studies I could come up with. They're all over a decade old. The one that uh, Charlie Vanderhorst did started all this sequence of events. The Hamill study actually was published in, what, 2010, but it was 10 years in the making of trying to get published, and finally Pete Pappas and group did uh, the interferon thing. So, again, we are in a data-free zone to, to the new guidelines uh, today, and many times we are dealing with extrapolations with guidelines that are coming from resource-limited uh, areas. I think we need to be committed to flu cytosine and completion of combination induction therapy, maybe more use of lipid amphotericin B formulations. I think we've actually said that within the uh, up-to-date, uh, the guidelines that need to reflect that. And resource-limited areas, the lateral flow assay will be great for the management as they continue to work on that. And needs to be committed to amphotericin B and flu cytosine or fluconazole, and some of the active data will support that. But for both, resource-limited and resource-available, uh, we've got to deal with iris, Increased intracranial pressure, uh, pressure, they are troublesome and deadly, and the management is empiric and evolving. So uh, I've gone over just a little bit. Um, as a prerogative, as a person on the committee, I, I started a little bit late. We had five instead of uh, four people. I'm looking down here at the thing, and I think what we can do is that if we, um, if we uh, take the half-hour break and uh, we come back here at about five till... Five o'clock, if we come back at five o'clock, then we have, and five to six, we should have enough to be able to do our, do our things. I want to put up a slide to say that ISHAM is, uh, is, could be a partner with the MSG, that it does have a, a, a meeting, uh, will be the, 
uh, next meeting uh, in New Delhi uh, in uh, 2000, uh, what, 2020. One. And so I just put that up there to please interact with, uh, with the groups at uh, ISHAM, uh, MSG. I think it's a small world here, but we just need to collect and connect uh, together very, very effectively. So thank you for the time. I, I guess I'll, I can take questions in, later on because we have a whole time to kind of interact with this thing. But uh, I was just trying to give you an idea of what the guidelines are evolving with. Thank you.